thanks for joining us, everyone, um, for our virtual sandbar lecture um, called A Rare Titanic Family um, with Julie Hedgepeth Williams. So a little bit of background on her. Julie Hedgepeth Williams fell in love with history because her great uncle Albert Caldwell survived the Titanic. He was 26 at the time and lived to be 91, and she knew him well. He loved to tell the story. Thanks to her family tie to history, Julie majored in history and English at Principia College. For most of the 1980s, she was a newspaper reporter and editor at the Sampson Independent in Clinton, North Carolina. Then Julie went to grad school at University of Alabama, where she got a master's and PhD, both focused on media history. Julie is the past president of the National American Journalism Associ Historians Association. Um, Julie's parents own a beach house on Oceanal Beach and a Julie Oceanal is the happiest place on earth. She vacations here twice a year and thinks vacation weeks go by too fast. She lives in Birmingham, Alabama with her husband and two dogs in a house built the year the Titanic was built, but which has lasted much longer. Their two sons are grown and flown. All right, so we get started. Listen, children, to a story that was written long ago. I wonder if you know that song. If so, you probably are my age. Now, those of you my age are trying to remember what that old song was about. And keep thinking, I'll tell you right now, though, it was not about the Titanic, although to me, that's what it was about. Because when that song was popular in the early 70s, we moved to Raleigh near my great uncle, Albert Caldwell, who lived in Richmond, Virginia. Uncle Al, as I called him, had survived the Titanic back in 1912 when he was 26. He lived to be 91 and I knew him well. That's Uncle Al in the picture there as I knew him. Uh, he always looked 125 and he always acted 25. That's me in the tulips. I was about five years old then. So you can tell I knew him all my life, but when we moved to uh, Raleigh in the early 1970s. Then I started hearing the story of the Titanic directly from him over and over and over again, which I loved. I wonder if you've thought what that old song is about. If you have remembered it, you remember it was about people fighting over a buried treasure. Now, the big excitement about this song was that when I was singing it around the house when I was 12 or 13, my, to my shock, my mother was actually listening to the lyrics. That was a, a, a stunner. And she said, buried treasure. We have a buried treasure in our family, and we did. Ours was on the Titanic at the bottom of the Atlantic, and it consisted of American gold coins that my uncle Al and his wife Sylvia were bringing home from Siam, we would say Thailand today. They had been missionaries there. And uh, Uncle Al always told me, honey, when they find the Titanic, you can have my gold pieces. I am still waiting. <laughs> I'll probably never see a nickel from those gold pieces, but I did get a wonderful golden treasure from the Titanic, which is the story that Uncle Al told me of how he and his wife, Sylvia, and their infant son, Alden, all three survived the Titanic, one of the few families to survive intact, making them a rare Titanic family. And this is the story as he told it to me. Al and Sylvia met as college sweethearts in Park College in Parkville, Missouri. That's my great uncle with hair. I think he was very handsome. I never knew him with hair. And that's his wife, Sylvia, whom I never knew. I think she was quite beautiful. They married on September 1st, 1909 and left the very day of their wedding to go to Bangkok to become missionaries. They didn't even have a honeymoon and I just know that's why they got divorced later. Here's where they were going, Bangkok Christian College, which was neither Christian nor college. All the boys in the school were Buddhists. Okay, so the staff was Presbyterian missionaries. That's where the Christian name came from. And it's today what we in the United States call a K-12 school. It was not a college. But in the Orient in that era, large schools were called colleges. And this school was a whopping 180 students, so it was called a college. Today, Bangkok Christian College is still there. Today, it has 5,000 students, and it's one of the oldest schools in Thailand. While the Caldwells were in Thailand, in Siam, their oldest son, Alden, was born. And I love this googly-eyed photograph of my great uncle making a face at his newborn baby. And on the back, he's written, speaking for the baby, for the land of love, is this my dad? He looks like a circus clown. 
I also love to look at all photographs for what we can see and discern about that time. Now, if you can see Uncle Al's boots, notice the heel of his boot there is crusted with stuff. You can tell by that that Bangkok, even though it was the capital, had no paved streets in his era. Uh, in fact, it got its first paved street in 1912, two weeks before the cobbles left. Now notice Uncle Al is sitting on a very loosely woven rattan chair that's designed to let the air flow through. He's wearing a light white linen suit. Notice his house behind him, it has walls that pull open and the walls are louvered. All right, you can guess by the photograph that Thailand is very hot. In fact, I looked up uh, the climate of Thailand on a modern website and it said Thailand has three seasons, the hot season, the hot and rainy season, and the hottest you've ever been in your life season. That is actually what it said. And one person who found it to be the hottest she'd ever been in her life was poor Sylvia, who was pregnant during the hottest you've ever been in your life season. Those ladies who've had a baby in the summer, oh yes, I know you're groaning. Anyway, Uncle Alois said the climate did not agree with my wife's health, so we decided to go home. So they took their life savings, which had been paid in Siamese tea cows, took them down to the Banque de l'Indochine there and said, please turn these to dollars, we're going to go home. And the bank said, we can do that for a 20% penalty. Yikes, Uncle Al said, we could do better than that. So he took the money down to the dock and waited for any American sailor to get off of any American ship because he knew that sailors always came with dollars, but if they wanted to go carousing, and they always wanted to go carousing. They had to have tea cows. And it didn't take him very long before he found somebody who was willing to trade dollars for tea cows with him. And that sailor paid him $100 in American gold coins. Now these were legal tender at the time, so they did not look as nearly as exotic as they do to us, to Uncle Al. He thought they were normal, normal pocket change. <laughs> and today they constitute our treasure at the bottom of the Atlantic because they never made it home. All right, now don't blink, because you're gonna see the Caldwells make a very fast trip to the Indian Ocean. Okay, they got on a boat called the Dareflinger, and away they went, don't blink. My own son, Alden, taught me how to do that. He's really proud of his old mama for learning something, and I'm proud for having learned how to do that. But that once, the three second trip on the map really took a long, grueling month through the Indian Ocean. And the Caldwells were so relieved to finally make it to Europe, to Naples. This was where they were going, at how it looked at the time. And on the day they arrived in Naples, there was a ship in the harbor flying the American flag, which they knew meant it was leaving for the United States that day. And Uncle Al asked a sailor, what ship is that? And he said, well, that's the Carpathia, leaving for New York this day. So according to my sister's memory, uh, he actually stood in line to buy tickets for the Carpathia, but changed his mind. I always remember that he actually got on board the Carpathia to scope it out. My mom, Uncle Al's niece, said, yeah, he definitely thought about taking the, the Carpathia home. But for reasons we never thought to ask, they changed their mind. And they went into Naples instead and got a hotel room. And there they saw an advertising placard that marked them for the rest of their lives. It was for the Queen of the Ocean, the Titanic, the world's largest ocean liner, setting sail on its maiden voyage to New York from Southampton, England in three weeks time. And Uncle Al turned to Sylvia and he said, there, that's the ship we're taking. So to get to Southampton, they had to first go through Rome and then through Florence and then through my favorite, Venice, and then through Lake Lucerne and then through Paris. And by the time they got to Paris, they were freezing cold. Their lightweight white linen clothes meant for the tropics were no good anymore. And so ooh la la ladies, they had to buy all new clothes in Paris. They were going to go home to the tiny crossroads of Biggsville, Illinois in absolute complete style. And they went to London. Well, about the first thing they did in London after they checked in at their hotel was to go to the offices of the White Star Line to seek second class passage on that ship they had seen advertised in Naples called the Titanic, and they asked for same, and the clerk said, sorry, sold out. Well, Uncle Al always said, I must have looked like a very disappointed boy because the clerk said, oh, sir, every day there's a cancellation. If you come in tomorrow, you can have the first cancellation that comes in. So Uncle Al got up very early the next morning, very nervous and sweating, and went and paced around in the office until a cancellation came in around noon, and it was even in second class exactly what the call was of one and 
They were the luckiest people in the world. They were going home on the Titanic. So on April 10, 1912, they boarded the boat train heading from London to Southampton. And everyone on the train was talking about how lucky they all were to be sailing on the world's largest, newest, and most luxurious line, ocean liner. And they kept saying, unsinkable. Well, Sylvia was really skeptical about this unsinkable thing, so much so that she asked a baggage handler taking their luggage to their cabin, is this ship really unsinkable? And he gave a notoriously erroneous reply, also the most famous line ever spoken about the Titanic, and I know you know what it is. He said, yes, lady, God himself could not sink this ship. Now that line is irresistible to people writing uh, stories about the Titanic. James Cameron stole it from our family in the movie Titanic. Titanic the musical stole it from our family and put it there. And we're really proud to know that through history, we know that through Sylvia Caldwell, it was told to her. The Caldwells had an absolutely beautiful voyage. It was wonderful. Oh, the music, the Caldwells were both so musical. And they were delighted because the Titanic's band played outside the second class library. They could hear music whenever they wanted. Oh, and the food. Uncle Al always said the tables were piled high with all the luxuries and delicacies one could ever want. And even better, no one was seasick. So everyone could eat those luxuries and delicacies. The Titanic was so big and so stable, none of the rolling and pitching like other ships. Well, one thing Uncle Al loved to do was to tour this great ship, as he called it. Now, he was among the vanguard of tourists with cameras. He had gotten one to go to Thailand and had sent pictures home of their newborn son, especially. And uh, he was taking pictures all over the ship. And one day he made his way down, talked his way down into the engine room where he took pictures of the stokers shoveling coal into the big old furnaces of the ship, which made the steam, which made the steamship go. Now he did not take this picture because his camera went down with the ship, but this is what it would have looked like. Well, being among the vanguard of tourists with cameras, of course he got the idea that all tourists would have from then forward. Hey, he wanted to be in the picture too. It, he wanted the 1912 version of a selfie. So he asked the stoker, would you take my picture and I can pretend to shovel the coal. And the stokers all egged him on. They didn't get that many visitors. So um, the one guy gave him the shovel and told him how to look authentic by holding it. And Uncle Lau gave him the camera and told him how to use it. And they exchanged names and the man took Uncle Al's photograph. Little did Uncle Al know that that photograph, that shovel full of coal would save his life. On April 14th, it was a Sunday. And of course our good missionaries went to the second class church service in the second class dining room at the Titanic. And it was a hymn sing. They sang hymn after hymn after hymn, but chief among the hymns, the one around which the volunteer pastor made a short sermon, was the old naval hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. And if you know it, sing it with me. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm upon the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep, its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. That last part is a prayer for people in danger at sea. Uncle Al said, we were so happy to be worshiping God that night. We just didn't know how many of us would meet God that night. Well, normally they took all of them for a spin on deck before bedtime, but it was too cold. Uncle Al stepped outside and said, no way. And Sylvia said, we went to bed to keep warm. Uncle Al was grateful to crawl into his top bunk, which was one of his two favorite places on the Titanic. The other place that was his favorite was the electric elevator between decks. Electric elevators were a novelty. No one had ever seen one before. So people waited in line to go to the next deck, whether they needed to go or not. And the other favorite place was his bunk. Now think about it. It was new. It was soft, no lumps. No one had ever slept in it before and no one would ever sleep in it again. And he had the top bunk, so it vibrated especially lots sympathetically with the vibration of the ship's engines. He said, oh, there was no better sleep. It was wonderful. Meanwhile, on the bottom box, Sylvia was not so lucky. She was sharing the bed with the baby. I don't know how she got any sleep. The baby had been kind of fussy, so she was lying awake when she felt the ship shudder. She actually felt the ship hitting the iceberg. She said it felt like a large dog shaking a small kitten in its mouth. 
So she tried to wake Uncle Lau, but she didn't try too hard because who wanted to wake the baby who had been fussy, right? So it was all, Albert, Albert, wake up. Well, Uncle Lau always thought he never heard her. Uh, I suspect he did subconsciously, but he said what woke him is he woke up at the start and knew right away the ship had come to a halt. Why? Because his bed was now a dead call. So he leaped out of bed, threw on a raincoat, ran out onto deck and found a sailor looking over the side. And he said, why have we stopped? stopped? And the sailor said, meh, just ran into a little iceberg. No harm done, I guess, go back to bed. So Uncle Al did. He went back, reported to Selby what the trouble was and climbed back into his bunk. And he said it was really, really hard to get back to sleep without those vibrations. But just as soon as he had drifted off, the Caldwells were shocked awake when someone pounded on their door and called everyone to the deck with their light belts on. Ah, oh, it was so discouraging because the baby was finally asleep and who wants to wake a baby at midnight? So they dressed in their oldest clothes. They left those new Parisian fashions aboard ship. They dressed very slowly. Finally, they realized that nobody was gonna come back and say, never mind. That's what they were hoping. So they realized they had to get the baby up. So they went to their travel trunk to get his little coat and his little hat. And unfortunately, they couldn't find the keys anywhere. They looked and looked and looked before they finally remembered what happened. When the baby was fussy earlier, they had done what parents have done since the beginning of keys. They had given the baby the keys to play with and he had lost them. He was only 10 months old. He couldn't talk. He didn't know that they were looking for them even. So they finally were forced to give up, wrap the baby in the blanket, leave his little coat and his little hat and the $100 that I am still waiting for in their cabin. And they went up on deck. It was very, very cold. It was midnight, but um, everybody was friendly. Everybody had some, some small talk. It was actually kind of pleasant that way. And they could all see a ship on the horizon with their lights burning. And Uncle Al says, to the worst, she'd come and save us. But they were shocked again when the crew started breaking out the lifeboats and calling for women and children to get aboard. Women and children were not interested. The very few who got aboard were thrown on by husbands or crew. Well, now the Cobbles had a choice to make. Should they put um, uh, Sylvia and Alden on the lifeboat? And Uncle Al said, well, let's test this. You know, if the ship is really sinking, it should be listing. But he tested it, it was perfectly flat underfoot. Um, he looked for signs of panic in the eyes of the crew. He saw none. He listened for the sound of the inrush of water. He heard none. But most importantly of all, as he went back to the cabin to get another blanket for the baby, he probably looked for that key again. But he, in doing so, he stepped through and then back through a watertight door that was still open. Now the Caldwells mistakenly understood that the Titanic was rendered unsinkable when the captain pushed an electric button on the bridge. That was new technology, that was really cool. And he could push an electric button that would lower watertight doors all over the ship and thus turn back the ocean. Now, in reality, that watertight, those watertight doors that operated by the button were only in the engine room, but they didn't know that. They understood the watertight door being open meant that the captain didn't think there was enough danger to have pushed that button. So they realized this was a, a precaution. So uh, they were waiting around for the all clear to go back to the Titanic, when all of a sudden a group of stokers suddenly appeared on the deck where they were waiting. <clears throat> and one of them recognized Uncle Al from the day of the photograph. And he called him by name. He said, Mr. Caldwell, and he locked eyes with him. He said, if you value your life, get off this ship. I've been below and the hold is filling up with water and this ship will go down. Well, Uncle Al argued briefly. He said, well, I thought the Titanic was one big lifeboat. And another stoker intervened and he said, well, let's say you get off on the lifeboat now if the big ship is still there tomorrow morning, you can get back on. Well, suddenly it came crystal clear to Uncle Al that that was the right answer. And the stoker stopped lifeboat 13 that was passing by their deck and got on and they followed. Uncle Al always credited divine intervention with this because his father was a pastor back in Illinois. And his father said he had gotten down on his knees that night and prayed for the safe return of his son, his daughter-in-law, and the grandchild he had never met. And they later found out that his dad always went to bed at 9.30 Illinois time, and that was 1.30 ship's time when this decision was made. Well, for a while, the Caldwells thought that LiPo 13 would be the story they told the rest of their lives, because boy, was it a hazard. You would expect the LiPo to go down smoothly on its pulleys, on its ropes, but no, something was wrong, and the boat pitched forward and back and forward and back, and people were screaming and hanging on for dear life. 
when they got to the water line, they were in front of a pump throwing water out of the Titanic. Sylvia said they were all drenched and it was a miracle so they didn't so much as catch cold. Well, the men hastily untied the oars and used them to propel the lifeboat out of the way of the water, which put them directly under lifeboat 15, kind of in the sketch there. And uh, there was coming down on top of them, threatening to crush them, but this didn't matter because all the men had to do was to pull a lever and it would release 13 from the side of the ship. But no, the lever was gummed up with shiny red paint. And boy, do I remember when I was 12 and Uncle Al mentioning the shiny red paint, I was so chagrined a big girl like me, 12 years old, had not realized the Titanic was in color. Because <laughs> back then, we didn't have the James Cameron movie. We had black and white photographs. Yes, the Titanic was trimmed in red, and the paint had pulled in the mechanism, and 13 was stuck. 15 was coming closer and closer, and the women were screaming, stop that boat, stop lowering that boat. But they couldn't see them, even what that what they meant, because they were, 15 was directly on top of them. The men were trying to pound on the lever. Finally, they gave up and stood on the Seats of 13 were able to pound on the bottom of 15. Mercifully, 15 got the message and stopped lowering. And someone from 15 threw a knife to 13 and the stokers used it to cut them free. So at last they were able to row half a mile away as directed. And it was only then that Uncle, Real, Uncle Al realized for the first time that the ship was truly in trouble. Her portholes, which should have been parallel to the water, were sinking rapidly by the bow still glowing with electric light, causing the sea to glow in electric green. And then the lights winked out, there was a horrible explosion, and the ship broke in half. The bow sank on its own. The stern floated for a few minutes longer, and then, as Uncle Alloy said it, with a gentle swish, she was gone. Well, there was a moment of horrified silence, and then the cries started. Everyone on the Titanic had been given a life belt. Many people were wearing them as they were cast into the ocean, but the water was 28 degrees. It was below normal freezing because salt water freezes at lower temperature than fresh, and they were rapidly freezing to death. So we described their cries as the weirdest, most appalling, most heartrending noise ever mortal might hear. One man in Lifeboat 13 said, oh, it's just people singing, Sylvia said, but who could be deceived? Now, I didn't remember Uncle Al talking about this. So when he was 90 years old, I said, Uncle Al, what about these people in the water? And Uncle Al was a very happy person. He always had a smile. He was always bright and upbeat. And this one time, the smile went away. And his face turned really gray. And this really impressed me at age 16. And he said, you just had to forget the screams or you'd go crazy. And I realized he'd been actively forgetting the screams for more than 60 years. Now, the Caldwells were safe in the lifeboat, true, but their lot was almost as dire because they only had six inches of clearance between the edge of the lifeboat and the water. They knew the first wave would put them in the water and they knew what would happen. Um, they kept straining their eyes on the horizon looking for a rescue ship, but all they could see were lights on other lifeboats. Finally, an hour after the, um, the Titanic stern had disappeared, a young man on the boat said he thought he saw another boat uh, you know, an actual ship coming, and nobody else could see it. Uncle Al said, we dare not hope, but after another hour, they could see that a ship was coming, and they were much cheered, and the sailors started rowing toward it, singing, uh, pull for the shore, sailor, pull for the shore, but then they realized that it was dark, and that ship could not see them. They couldn't find a light on their boat. Now they were worried they would get run over by the rescue ship, and so they finally agreed they would burn their coats if they had to on that bitterly cold night. Well, at that point, a woman in their boat heroically dived down into her purse and came up with letters she had written, kind of a diary from Europe that she meant to give to her daughters. And they twisted those into torches and lit them one by one by one. So that when the sun rose, they were very near the rescue ship. And Uncle Al was shocked to recognize it. It was the Carpathia the very ship he and Sylvia had turned down in Naples, now on her way back to Naples. And they were very grateful now to be added to her passenger list. Both Al and Sylvia said the saddest thing was watching the women of the Titanic line the, rail of the, line the rails of the Carpathia as each lifeboat pulled up, looking for a husband, a son, a brother, or a sweetheart who never came. Now that was the story as Uncle Al told it to me a story I knew very well, and a story that has been proven true and accurate in every uh, possible test. And yet, I came to find out we had hardly known the story at all. 
We began to realize this when Uncle Al passed away in 1977 when he was 91 years old. And among his effects that came to my mother was this photograph of a young couple on a very large ship. My dad, an engineer, could tell that the size of the cable behind the man there was very large. And we thought, could this be the cobbles on the Titanic? It wasn't labeled. It was not in context. Nothing else was from a ship. So we spent the next two weeks in research to try to figure it out. We looked at the weather on sailing day when this would have had to have been taken. Was it overcast? Yes. Were the fashions appropriate for 1912? Yes. Can we recognize the ships behind it? We could from their smokestacks. Yes. Um, we had all sorts of clues, including Uncle Al holding his hand. See, he's holding the baby with his hand, a gap there, and he always had his finger like that, like there had been a break in one of his fingers at some point. Because you could scarcely recognize the adults. The baby was clear. <laughs> but anyway, we definitely recognized Uncle Al's finger gap there. Anyway, so at the end of two weeks, we not only knew that it was the Caldwells on the Titanic, but we knew exactly where they were standing. But as a final test, we took it to my great Aunt Jenny, Uncle Al's second wife. At that time, Aunt Jenny was in a nursing home, though very sharp of mind, she just needed some physical care. And so we brought her a bunch of photographs for her to identify. We thought they might cheer her up as well. And I, without telling her what we thought it was, I flipped over the photograph of the Titanic and I said, Aunt Jenny, what's that? And she said, oh, there's Albert on the Titanic. I forgot we had that old thing. Because as you can imagine, for all the 40 years Aunt Jenny was married to Uncle Al, she got to hear over and over and over again about his adventures with his first wife. So it was a family joke that she was, you know, really tired of the Titanic. She took it with good humor. Anyway, we said, how did he get the picture, Aunt Jenny? Because we knew his camera had gone, up, gone down with the ship. And she said, ah, oh, a friend in London took it and sent it later. That was all she knew. And that was probably all we'd ever know. Aunt Jenny loved to paint. This is a reproduction picture she had painted, uh, something else she'd seen. But it, it's evocative of the Titanic leaving port, and it tells Aunt Jenny's opinion on the Titanic. There's a little dog watching the Titanic go, and at the bottom it says, should all acquaintance be forgot? Which I always thought was funny. Aunt Jenny was very funny. Then there was the mystery of the Carpathia. Why did the Caldwells consider taking the Carpathia home from Naples if they were planning that big trip through Europe? Suddenly that didn't make any sense. It had never occurred to us before that it didn't, and we hadn't thought to ask. It was too late, right? Then there were rumors about why they left Siam to start with. Um, it, there, here we hear the cobbles are leaving Siam. I'm dressed as Sylvia here, although she's a lot younger and cuter than I am. Anyway, all our lives growing up, my sisters and I had heard that uh, Sylvia wasn't really sick when they left Siam, that she was just faking an illness. And the older I got, the more I realized that uh, we really need to revisit that thought because she was the first wife and we were the family of the second wife. And whenever there was a question about the Titanic, we blamed the first wife, right? And I realized I owed it to history to find out, was Sylvia really sick? Then there was a mystery that rose up from the depths after all three of the Kawas had lived to a ripe old age and died of natural causes, not shipwrecked. Someone put an auction, uh, a watch up for auction at Christie's Auction House in London saying it was the watch the Caldwells used to bribe their way off the Titanic. I just couldn't believe that. And no one in my immediate family could either because Uncle Al had spoken about the Titanic from 1912 to 1976 in public with his head held high and a smile on his face. He didn't seem to be ashamed of anything or hiding anything, nor did he ever mention a bribe. But again, I owed it to history to find out. Well, all of those things had to do with whether or not somebody was really sick or not. If I could solve whether she was really sick or not, I would probably be able to answer all these other questions, I thought. So my next question to my husband was, guess what, honey? And he said, what? And I said, we're going to Philadelphia for our vacation because that's where the Presbyterian archives were and I was determined to go. So good man that he is, he packed us all up into the van and we drove from Birmingham, Alabama, where we live to Philadelphia. And one day while my husband and my sons were at the battleship there, an old battleship, I went to the Presbyterian Historical Society and I looked through Uncle Al's and Sylvia's files. It was so interesting. I found out so much about them. Then I got to the part where they resigned. I thought, oh, I'm really going to find out now why they resigned. And it said, resigned. And that was all it said. Ah, so we had fun in Philadelphia anyway. We went home and I started ordering um, microfilms willy-nilly from the Historical Society. They freely admitted their microfilms are not in a good order. You just had to kind of take your chance. And after reading through many, many pages, I finally came across the one that I was looking for. 
Now, it's hard to read, but it's the first page here, number three, and it says in the first two lines, Mrs. Caldwell's case is a case of marked neurasthenia due to her residence in the tropics. That was her doctor's diagnosis, neurasthenia. And at the bottom of that page, it says if she continues to remain here, she may lose her mind, the same as Mrs. Barrett. Wow. Who is Mrs. Barrett? Okay, let's take those questions apart. Neurasthenia, what is it? We've never heard of it today because it was outlawed as a disease in 1932. Now, that's not quite the right word, but it ceased to be a diagnosis in 1932. It was popularly diagnosed from this time of the Civil War to 1932. And the reason it was canceled from the diagnosis lexicon was because by 1932, everyone had supposedly been told they had it, and they all had different symptoms. Like if you had neurasthenia, you might be bent double and couldn't straighten up. You might have chronically blurred vision and they couldn't fix it. You might have arms and legs that didn't work. This seemed to be Sylvia's problem. Or like these soldiers, you had shell shock. We would call it today PTSD, but a lot of soldiers got neurasthenia and it was related to shell shock. Uh, if you were generally depressed, just depressed, you, you were had it. If you were had a lingering malaise, you had it. Now notice all those symptoms were quite different. And I read some uh, records from a neurasthenia hospital and they were all quite different. You did have physical symptoms. But because they were so different in 1932, they said, okay, this is just now a catch-all disease, meaning I don't know what you got. So I'll call it neurasthenia. So it ceased to be a diagnosis. One generous medical historian told me that at that point they divided into different diseases. We can think of it that way. But it is a practical matter but if you called yourself a neurasthenic in 1933, people began to think of you as a hypochondriac because your doctor had not told you that, you had told you that. And that's where it became known as a hypochondriac's disease, which is one of the ways that we began to realize that Sylvia was called, um, it was saying, it was said she was faking an illness because she'd been diagnosed what is now considered a hypochondriac's disease. Um, so as you can see the, uh, by this slide, neurasthenia was already under some doubt in 1912 because five of the Caldwell's fellow missionaries voted down their attempt to leave. Now, why did they have to ask? Couldn't they give their two weeks notice and go? No. <laughs> they were expected to stay in Siam for the rest of their lives. But the way it worked was you had a, a seven year hitch, then you had a year off and you came back. Now, a lot of missionaries washed out on that year off and just never came back. But the Caldwell's were only two years into that seven year hitch. So they had to ask permission to go home. And as you can see by the slide, the five missionaries voted them down. So now they were, knew they were in trouble because the same thing had happened to their friends, the Connie Bears. We'll talk about them in a minute. But let's look at that allusion to Mrs. Barrett. If, she, if Sylvia stays in Siam, she will lose her mind the same as Mrs. Barrett. What did that mean? Well, I had to go searching to find Mrs. Barrett. I finally found her in a book of, of missionary stories from 1908. And these books were put out every year with the goal of convincing you and me to become missionaries. They were happy, sanitized stories of what good work missionaries were doing and how much fun it was to see the world. They were always really upbeat. Mrs. Barrett's upbeat story was this. Mrs. Barrett went stark, raving mad in the tropical heat, and she had to be carried away by native boats. Whoa, and that was the sanitized story. That was a very creepy story. It was clear that Cobbles knew all about her because the minute Mrs. Barrett's name came up, all hell broke loose. They were not going to stay in Siam. They could not have Sylvia go insane like Mrs. Barrett. They had to go. And that's why they were actually released ultimately is that the mission felt they would get no more work out of them. They were so weirded out by being compared to Mrs. Barrett. And in fact, their doctor was fired as the mission doctor for bringing up Mrs. Barrett's name. It was that incendiary. But before he was fired, Dr. Walker gave him the prescription to take the rest cure <clears throat> in Southern Italy to go to a spa that catered to neurasthenics. That would have been why they were going to Naples. Okay, now I mentioned the Connie Bears a minute ago, Sam and Bess Connie Bear, best friends of the Caldwells in the mission. They were also a young couple from the Midwest. They met there and they became fast friends. They also had wanted to leave before their seven year hitch was up. What happened was that uh, Sam was transferred to a, a, a small town out away from Bangkok where he was supposed to act as the ordained minister. He was supposed to perform marriages and funerals, especially marriages. He said, I'm not ordained. I can't, I can't perform these. You know, it's not official marriage. 
And his boss said, you will go. And he said, I will not go. And Arr! they got at loggerheads. Now their daughter is still living in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She's very elderly. She believes Bess had a miscarriage at that time. And she thought that their, maybe their ultimate goal, and maybe this is what their boss actually discerned, was that they wanted to go home on the opportunity to have a baby in a more safe environment in their, in their thinking. And um, we have Bess's diary to this day, and poor Bess cried every day about wanting to go home and needed to go home and not to take this assignment away. Well, they did the unthinkable, the Connie Bears did. Here are the Connie Bears on the left playing dominoes with the Caldwells on the right. And after about six months, the Connie Bears came up with enough money to go home. That was a shocker. Because today, if you and I needed to leave Bangkok and get home in a hurry, we could probably plunk down a couple thousand dollars and fly out of there in 24 hours. It would put a dent in our bank account, but we could do it. Back then, it was a two-month trip halfway around the world and it involved ships, hotels, and trains. It was really, really hyper expensive. And the church was supposed to pay for their trip home. It was part of their salary. And here, because the Connie Bears had been voted down until they couldn't go, they had to pay their own way home. And this made Bess cry too in her, in her diary. Anyway, they suddenly came up with enough money to go home. Now, according to their daughter, she believes that their relatives in Iowa had an all out fundraiser, collected money and then wired the money. She knows for sure they stopped in England on their way home and took jobs there and worked, stayed with a relative and worked for a while to earn their passage across the Atlantic and into Iowa. But in any case, they suddenly came up with the money. This was a shocker. And they were very bitter about having to fund their own way home. And so Sam did probably what you and I would do, what we shouldn't do. He mouthed off to his boss because it was, he didn't think it was fair. And, uh, and he said, you know, we're not the only unhappy missionaries here. Other missionaries are saving their money to go home too. Well, he never said who the other missionaries were. But in writing this up for his bosses, their boss said, evidently, he's talking about the Caldwells. So from that moment until they, the Caldwells asked to go home six months later, the boss was waiting for them to ask, and he was waiting to say no. It, he is, he's the other thread of the belief that she was not really sick. He believed they were just saving their money. Now, to you and me, that sounds like good stewardship, but to the boss, it sounded like reneging on a promise. And before I forget it, I should say that Bess's diary exonerates Sylvia. Every time Bess mentions Sylvia in her diary, she said how sick Mrs. Caldwell is. Mrs. Caldwell will have to go home. Mrs. Caldwell's feeling really bad. So Sylvia was sick. At the time, she was pregnant. But if I had had a bad pregnancy that bad, I would have been panicky too. It was, it was, it was not a pretty thought. Anyway, uh, the charge the Caldwells were saving their money was not without merit. Do you remember the tea cows that turned into the gold? The gold I'm still waiting for? The call was freely admitted they were saving that money. Now, they had saved $100 from their salary. That doesn't sound like a lot today, but it was about $3,000 today at face value. So they had done pretty well, considering they had a small baby. Now, another question. They were finally sprung to go home. So they went, and they got as far as Naples. And now we knew they had been sent to Naples for the rest cure, but somebody didn't take the rest cure. Why did they consider taking the Carpathia. Why did they go through Europe? This was getting more confusing instead of clearer. And isn't Naples beautiful there? Anyway, why did they not do that? And their grandson stepped in with a memory. He remembered that they were terrified of catching cholera. So I started researching cholera in Naples. And sure enough, there was cholera in Naples when they arrived. And they knew they couldn't stay in Naples. Uh, the cholera at the time was described as healthy this morning, death this afternoon, still a dangerous disease. And they realized they would have to take the first ship they saw leaving. They just agreed they could not stay. So that's why they were going to leave. But they, um, they, they, the first ship they saw flying the American flag, meaning it was leaving for the United States, was the Carpathia. But why didn't they take it? Again, their grandson stepped in with a memory. He said he remembered that his grandmother, Sylvia, was terrified of a small ship that she was very, very seasick. And once he told me that, I started researching seasickness in her record, and I found it. She wrote home to her college alumni magazine that she was seasick every single day for the entire month they were on the Indian Ocean. Now, when you write to your college magazine, you don't talk about seasickness, right? You talk about your job or your children or your dog or your new house, you don't talk about seasickness. So you could tell how important that was to her, how bad it was. And, um, I, re I had reckoned out that they come across the Indian Ocean on the Dare Flinger, 
And then I had this sort of moment of uh, inspiration. I thought, how big was the Derflinger compared to the Carpathia? They were the exact same size. So she had been seasick every single day for a month on a ship, the exact same size as the Carpathia. And this is why when they saw the ad for the largest ship in the world, the Titanic, they realized that was a better choice because the larger the ship, the less seasickness. And with the magic of PowerPoint, we could park the Titanic next to the Carpathia and you could indeed see what a much bigger ship it was. Uh, and indeed it works. Sylvia was not seasick, but had not been for the accident with the iceberg. Anyway, so as they headed home, having bypassed Naples, the Caldwells were maybe unaware that they were still under scrutiny and surveillance by their mean old boss back in Bangkok. About a week after they had been approved to go home, apparently their boss changed his mind and he cabled ahead to their headquarters in New York and he said, oh, the Caldwells are heading home. When they arrive in New York, have one of our doctors examine Mrs. Caldwell before you settle their account. Translation, if Sylvia were found healthy, the Caldwells would have to go back to Siam to finish their term of service, or they would have to pay for their trip home, just like the Connie Bears had. And when I read that, I gasped so loud that it brought every librarian in the library I was reading at this end to see what I found out. I nearly fell off the chair in shock because for years I had known that when Sylvia arrived in New York that there was a private ambulance ready to take her directly to Presbyterian Hospital. For years I had thought, how nice. The Presbyterian Missionary Board is taking care of somebody who's sick that's one of their missionaries. And now I realized that for years I had been wrong. They were laying in wait for Sylvia. Or did the Caldwells know because Sylvia avoided that ambulance? She did not go on the ambulance. She did not have that examination. Were the Caldwells tipped off? I think so, but if you wanna know how, you have to read my book. But what about the bribe? Did Uncle Al really take a bribe to get, do a bribe, give a bribe to get off, off the Titanic? Now I examined this completely as a historian. I decided if he had taken a bribe, I was okay with that because I was glad he was my great uncle. But I have to say that there's really almost no chance he did this, if any at all. All research showed that Sylvia couldn't hold the baby. Every account of them coming to the lifeboat, including by some total strangers, goes like this. A mama and a daddy and a baby came to the lifeboat with the daddy holding the baby. This was unusual enough, but that's how everybody described them. And then Sylvia got aboard and either she asked or the officer even said to her, hey, does your, does your husband need to hold the baby? Something like that. Can my husband get on to hold the baby? In any case, the officer said, yes, you need to get on board the lifeboat and hold the baby to my great uncle because it was clear that Sylvia couldn't do it. Now, one of the myths about the Titanic I should clear up was that men were not allowed off. The Titanic was divided into half. And on one half, men were not allowed off. On the other half, men were allowed off. It was just the different officers interpreted the order differently. Uncle Al was on the side that allowed men off. So there was no restriction for him getting onto the lifeboat, except for it possibly being full, but it wasn't. And, um, and so he, and, and so there are already men on the lifeboat. So, uh, but everybody's account was the officer insisted he get aboard because he needed to hold the baby. Also no account of them getting on the lifeboat mentioned a bribe. Bribes were serious and exciting stories in the news. If they had had to bribe their way onto the lifeboat, it would have made the papers. Everybody would have been talking about it. The two photographs we have of them in this era tend to bear this out. Notice in both of these photographs, who's holding the baby, and the uh, one on the left, the sepia one, where they're leaving Siam in February of 1912, daddy's holding the baby. In April of 1912, on the deck of the Titanic, daddy's holding the baby again. And notice that Sylvia's kind of propping herself on the rail, as though she can't quite stand up in that one. Then there's the Scottish factor. The watch in question was engraved on the back to James Caldwell of the Pumperston Oil Company in Scotland, or Pumperston Oil Company, because you can look that up and find it's in Scotland. Here's how it looks, it's a cute little town. Anyway, the auction house implied that James Caldwell and Albert Caldwell were relatives. Now, we can't find that they were actually relatives, but let's just say they were, just for argument's sake. Um, and the uh, auction house said that James Caldwell visited Albert Caldwell in his home at 2 Upper Montague Street, London, to bring him this watch that he later used to bribe his way off the Titanic. Well, right away, there was trouble because the Caldwells, my Caldwells, never lived at 2 Upper Montague Street, London. They lived in Bangkok. 
I was half a world away. But that's what the auction house thought. And I thought, where did they get that? Well, that was the address the Caldwells gave when they were trying to get that canceled ticket. And after much research, I stumbled onto it. It was the address of a hotel called The Bansha. So it was the hotel they were staying at at the time. Okay, um, so now we know they were there about a week. Luckily, we know what James Caldwell was doing that week. James Caldwell ran a coal mine for Pumperston Oil Company. And starting in January of 1912 and going to the day after the Titanic sailed, there was a coal strike against all coal mines in Great Britain, including the one in, in Pumperston. However, James Caldwell would not accept that. He forced his miners to go to work. Needless to say, they were not happy, so they set the mine on fire. James Caldwell had to put out the fire. To this day, the town of Pumperston's website praises James Caldwell for saving the town at that point by putting out the fire. The miners threw bathtubs down the shaft and James Caldwell had to pull those bathtubs out. Now, does that sound like James Caldwell was gonna get in the train and travel several hours to visit a relative at a hotel in London and give him a watch? It just doesn't stand to reason. So I concluded that the watch story was just a nice made up story to make a lot of money on a watch that belonged to someone named Caldwell, and indeed it did make a lot of money. But interestingly, solving the watch allegation helped us solve another mystery that I thought we'd never know, which was who took this photograph on the Titanic. And I believe it was this dapper gentleman here spinning around with his umbrella. His name is Jeremiah McVeigh. He's a member of parliament, and he lives at and runs the hotel at 2 Upper Montague Street, London. And members of parliament in that day did not make enough money to have solely that job. They had to have another job. So he ran a hotel and he also, if you see down in the lower right hand corner of his photograph, he wrote for the Irish News of Belfast. He was a journalist. And the Titanic was built in Belfast and all of Mr. McVeigh's constituents made their money in some fashion after shipbuilding. And a lot of them had had a hand in building the Titanic. And I believe that he tagged along with them in order to cover the departure of the ship or perhaps he was already going with his press credentials. In any case, he could have taken the photograph and then his sister who ran the uh, hotel on a day-to-day -day basis could have sent them the photograph later because she had their forwarding address. And I believe that was the friend who sent the picture later. Now, one thing we did not um, solve in time for my book to be published was whose baby booties these were. We found these crushed flat next to a book that Sylvia had written about the Titanic and I am just convinced that little Alden was wearing them off the Titanic. Uh, we did try them on my own son Alden and my son Weston when they were 10 months old and they fit fine. And also we have found out quite by some lucky happenstance that they are from the right era. They, are, they were made about the same time that Alden was about that age. And so they could have been Aldens. However, we can't say for sure. And here's hoping someday we find out. Now, if you want to hear Uncle Al tell the story of the Titanic himself, you can go to my webpage here and go to the Titanic section. And when you see audio of interest, click on that. Uh, there's a, a link below that picture. And it's a recording of Uncle Al talking at age 90 about the Titanic. If you want to read Sylvia's own account, Google New South Books and click on Women of the Titanic Disaster, which is the booklet she wrote in 1912. Uh, about the women that she observed while she was on the Carpathia. It's just about 15 pages long, and there are only two copies that we can find in the entire world. I own one of them. And uh, so uh, my publisher agreed to put that up as an ebook for people. So you can certainly read that as an ebook. And uh, meantime, I thought I'd throw up again a picture of my book. Uh, you can order that from New South Books or your local bookstore or some online retailer like Barnes and Noble or Amazon. If you want to contact me by Facebook, I'm at Julie Hedgepeth Williams, the name down there on the book. And you can contact me and I'd be happy to arrange to send you a signed copy. If you want to email me, I'm sure that the museum will be happy to forward your inquiry to me and I can email you or call you. And in my webpage, I've given that again for people to look back at and say, okay. Now, A Rare Titanic Family, uh, the book was the winner of the 2014 Ella Dickey Literacy Award for Books That Preserve History, and I shared the award that year with former First Lady Laura Bush, which made me very proud, uh, and I think the book is a great book. I think you'll love reading it. Anyway, if I were present with you, I would take questions at this point. I'd be happy to take your questions on Facebook or, or however you want to get them to me. And thanks for listening to this, and I hope to see you at the beach another year.